progress with Red Plus is much more slower than we anticipated. And we means as a research community from 2006, 7 onwards, we thought Red would just move on. Because at that time it was thought of as something quick, cheap, easy, the perfect mechanism to tackle a global problem, which is deforestation and forest degradation and the resulting emissions. But then Red Plus was not that quick, it was for sure not that easy and it is not that easy and it's also not cheap as we thought of. There is um, the idea of Red Plus moving through three phases. So the first phase would be Red Plus readiness, the second phase would be Red Plus policies and measures implementation and learning from demonstration sites. And the third phase was the basically the market element or the performance element where it comes to results-based payments because of performance. And everybody thought this move of countries through these three phases from readiness through policies, implementation and into results-based payments was much faster. But unfortunately countries as we find are stuck in phase one, readiness. And there are many reasons for that, so why countries are stuck in this readiness phase, but it's also in our studies what we recently found in 12 out of Red Plus countries, so our global comparative study, just to mention that, so I'm responsible there for the policy research. And we look at 14 countries and try to understand how Red Plus is in these countries. As lessons from all these 14 countries and the studies we are doing there, what we realized was that, um, in fact, these, all these countries, as I mentioned before, all these countries are stuck in this readiness phase. And what we saw was that at the very beginning, where Red Plus was thought of as cheap, quick, easy, that you had a lot of different actors and actor coalitions happily joining under this um, canopy of the Red Plus idea. And they were sitting there, they shared the same vision, the same idea, but for very different reasons, so for very different interests. However, they could all join under this big idea of Red Plus. Then countries worked together to manage to get this Red Plus idea designed as a Red Plus strategy and then with follow-up implementing policies. But that's the moment where this honeymoon phase of what a wonderful idea is really over. And we see now that countries don't really manage to establish policies to really learn from existing demonstration sites to actually realize a red plus that would lead to performance-based payments and to results. And this honeymoon phase is over, I think becomes quite obvious because now you have really political struggles. You have actors that no longer happily agree on the broad idea, but that strongly disagree on the how to realize that idea. The way we try to understand that with our research, the perspective we are taking is a political economy perspective because there are a number of reasons and ways how you can explain that something, not something, but a political process, a policy process is not moving as fast as anticipated. And the perspective we are taking is a political economy one, and that is related to the fact that the first question you have to ask is what makes deforestation and forest degradation? And you can talk, in some countries you find a lot of discourse, it's the shifting cultivator, the smallholder, the illegal logging, but what is overlooked, in, or not overlooked, but what is not really made explicit is, and that's a central finding from all our studies, it's the large-scale drivers, the large-scale conversion of land. It's the agribusiness that in most countries drives strongly deforestation. And it seems to be for all countries very complicated or delicate or difficult to actually tackle these underlying causes, so the political economy of deforestation and forest degradation. The way we are trying to understand that is by providing a framework which we call the four eyes. So in fact, what we are doing is we are seeing Red Plus through this four eye lens. And four eye lens means that something I mentioned earlier as well is 
you have to imagine a policy process where you have a policy arena. Yeah? So you have this kind of global policy arena, you have this national policy arena, sub-national policy arenas, which are all there where actors come together to design a mechanism that is called Red Plus. And obviously these actors don't operate in something totally new. This policy arena is created by existing institutions. Means existing norms, values, procedures, regulations, behaviors. So you have an institutional setup there in which all these actors operate and try to realize or maybe even to not realize Red Plus. And not realize comes from not everybody has an interest in Red Plus. So if I benefit, if I have really huge profits from deforestation and forest degradation as an individual, as a corporate body, as an organization. If I benefit from that, why should I have an interest in realizing Red Plus? So then obviously my interest is to make sure that my, my benefits, my profit, my revenues also come in in the future without Red Plus. So here you see a little bit why this term policy arena is so nice because you have to imagine really actors struggling. Some actors do join, they build coalitions, policy coalitions, but other actors are really opposing those coalitions. From the very beginning, I said folks were kind of gathering together under this canopy of that idea. And you have very vocal environmental, international and national NGOs. You have a much less vocal civil society in these countries, especially from the bottom up, so from the project level. But you also have actors that are very vocal and that voice an agency, that voice their interests, which are, which are, you, um, uh, which are kind of gathering together and trying to build an alliance, a coalition, against those actors that they think would be either not realizing Red Plus or not realizing this idea as a very as a carbon effective, cost efficient, but also equitable idea. And so what you see in this policy arena is you see these different actors getting together and trying to voice their interests and not only voicing them, but you voice because you want to realize in this political process. So you have this institutional environment that creates this policy arena, then you have your multitude of diverse actors. Obviously countries are different. You have a country like Cameroon where for example, only a very small group of state actors and a larger group of environmental NGOs with a little bit of research is talking about Red Plus. Business is completely absent there and we find that business is very absent in most policy arenas. So they don't really speak and if I say business then I talk about large scale large-scale business that drives deforestation and forest degradation. So I don't talk here about this nice, beautiful green business, the carbon investors, uh, the consultancy services that come with every new policy initiative. I'm really talking about this established business as usual driving deforestation private sector. Another thing that drives actors and that explains why there is very little progress now in this very complicated phase of political negotiations in the different countries is beside the institutional environment and actors' interest, it's also the ideas actors have. And that's where ideas means, so what kind of belief do you have, what forest should be, how an economy should be, so the entire mindset that drives an actor in his decision-making and his engaging. And it's not only what drives yourself as an idea or ideology, but this is also about what enables others to join you. So where you have shared ideas, then you move forward. And that's a little bit the story also about the business sector and the state. They have pretty much the same discourse. They speak the same language and that means they are very, yeah, very close and they share a common idea. You find the same with, uh, we find a lot of coalitions around environmental NGOs with a little bit of civil society and um, international research organizations as well.
We have already three eyes now, institutions, interests, as well as ideas. And there is, and that is very specific for Red Plus, there is a fourth eye that's central and that's information. And we integrated information in our framework, how to understand progress and non-progress with Red Plus. We integrated information here because Red Plus as a mechanism has an architecture where you have your financial systems and you have your information system. Which means here you have so your locality where the emissions are reduced, where deforestation, forest degradation is avoided or reduced. And now this has to be observed, measured, monitored, reported, then also verified in one way. So you have this, in this national architecture, what you have to imagine is a huge part is this whole reporting, information sharing. And based on the information that is given, then there will be a financial action. So this technical information about a carbon unit has to be translated into a financial transaction. And here again, we have this kind of global funds, global markets, carbon markets, regional markets, whatever. And then your very specific national, sub-national, down to the very local place where the result was achieved, that emissions or the performance was done. And that's where you want to reward. So it's very complex and what you can see is that information is a very crucial element here in this whole process of realizing Red Plus. And information is interesting because information is also a resource. And some actors do have information, other actors would need information and other actors don't get access to information or have access to information. So. In fact, what one could say is that information is a currency in our in today's world, where it's it's really also about power. And if I'm the ministry XYZ that has the full data sets of deforestation, maybe I don't want to share that information because also information is not something totally objective, as we all would like to believe. But facts get selected, facts get interpreted. Facts get reinterpreted, facts get reselected, and sometimes you just get a few facts that give a very different picture of a reality that if you would have full information would look very different. So information can be used as something very political and that's the reason why it is in our political economy framework. Also because if we think about power, and power is very central in these policy struggles, so who has the power to realize his or her own idea of what Red Plus should be or should not be? That's the big question. So power is central in this arena and then you can think about information also as a source of power. Because it, you can't ignore an organization even though you know maybe this ministry has reported uh, very dubious numbers for decades, you still cannot ignore it if it is the ministry with the numbers. So, like it or not, you have to deal with it. The big question is really how to move from this kind of business as usual, the current way of how deforestation, forest degradation is done and is motivated and is possible. So the political economy of that. How to change that, to move to a situation where you have actually this transformational change that would be required to make a red plus happening. And when I talk about transformational change, then I mean, for example, removal of perverse subsidies that would really kick off. And we see that in countries like for example, in Peru, you see this conflict between new ministry regulations from the agricultural ministry that are completely contradicting what the whole Red Plus idea would like to want. So you have Indonesia is the same. So you have this conflict of the development discourse. We need land to develop our country, to ensure food security, to, to, to. But in all cases, we need land for that. So forest is seen as a source of land for development purposes. That's the f how it is framed. 
And obviously that clashes very much with the idea of, oh, there is so much value midterm, long term. If we really would think about it, there is so much value in standing forests, so let's keep it there. not only the removal of perverse subsidies, it's not only this kind of broader changes in regulatory frameworks, governance frameworks such as tenure, which is considered very crucial, but it's also implementing actual red plus policies, like a moratorium. And I think we all know there is a huge debate about the Indonesian moratorium. Beautiful idea, but as a colleague called it once, it's all about the politics of the possible and the moratorium got incredibly weak over time. So it's really the question what is possible in this context of clashing ideas, clashing interests, with different access to information and in an institutional setup that is very sticky. And this move from business as usual to this transformational change scenario where you would have in place major changes in governance structures, in regulatory frameworks, in terms of subsidies, perverse subsidies, in terms of forest industry reforms. I think that's really crucial. And because Red Plus is not a policy problem in the forest sector, but you really have to change everything around it, it's why Red Plus progress is hard to achieve. And we see that.